am Jamie Smith and my work is primarily in pen and ink, typically in black and white. Um, and I included this slide just to give you kind of a general sense of what I do, um, but also to say that it took me a very long time to find my voice. So I did do the typical, uh, a typical perhaps route of I went to art school, but I think art school in so many ways was wasted on me. I was quite young and quite naive and had very, very little life experience, but it was a great time. I went to the University of Victoria and I actually minored in business, which seems a little counterintuitive sometimes to people, but turning with what I've ended up doing, it made a lot of sense. And I then went and traveled and really didn't know who I was or what I was doing. And I realize now um, it'll be 10 years. So 10 years ago, I left, I had started as a teacher and I decided I would be an artist. So it took me definitely a few years in that process to find out how I wanted to make art. I did abstract painting, I did collage, I did a lot of things. Um, and then I would say maybe five, six years ago, I, I stumbled on pen and ink. And it was the first time that I started working and thought every time I made something, I could feel the next thing that needed to be made. And I could feel that there was so much more to say and do. And I felt like before when I was making work, I'd finish a series and then feel very lost and not sure what to go with next. So this was a big milestone for me to say, you know, this is what I want to do. And then usually it's on paper, but then I moved into actually doing like wooden cutouts that vase. Um, I now work on my iPad quite a bit. I started using ink a lot more. You can see in the, the top left there. So my process started off um, very much with this black and white ink and then has morphed and kind of grown with me, which to me was always what I was searching for. How do I find a style, a voice that would grow with me and not feel like I was always outgrowing it? So this is sort of who I am now as an artist, I have 10 years of really making it a priority. And I wanted to include a big milestone for me was last year, I put on my own solo show. So I had um, done a ton of group shows. I had done my own shows in the past, but definitely not with kind of who I am now as an artist. So this show is called Mother Time. And it was the first time I incorporated color. It was the first time that I did an installation piece. And I was really lucky, a friend, um, Zoe Pollock, who's a painter here in Vancouver, has this beautiful showroom. And I got this beautiful showroom and um, got to put on this piece, uh, this show. It was only a weekend. Um, and this is the installation I built. It's called The Waiting Room. And the show is actually all about my fertility journey. So fertility for me has been a huge problem. <laughs> it's been something that hasn't happened. And so this was something that I was going through deeply and me and my partner were, were struggling with it. And it was the first time that I took an act. My work has always had personal things, but this show was directly about something personal and putting it out to the world. So this waiting room, the concept is that when you want something very bad, badly, it kind of colors the world that you live in. So everywhere I went, I felt like I saw babies or pregnant woman, women and it was this feeling that you're engulfed in it. So this is toile, um, a pattern that I made and it's uh, in the 18th century French artists would do toile all about what was going on in their world. So for me, it felt very like an homage to this is what's happening. And then I had I made hospital gowns and people could put on the hospital gowns and sit in their waiting room. So that's me in my hospital gown. I also made some fun shoes. And um, the clock was had a ticking sound behind it of this idea of this time running out, which was how I felt all the time. So this show was a big milestone for me. Another thing I do is that I um, teach quite a bit. My background was in teaching. So I um, have another creative income source, which is Skillshare. So it's a great platform to take classes, but also to do your own classes as creative. So I wanted to share a little bit, you know, the idea of creative life of how I kind of sustain this creative life. So I have my art practice, I have Skillshare, 
And then I run community. So I'm very interested in how female identifying and non-binary and queer artists can support each other. So this is the Thrive Together community. We have a map that our artists work through. There's some members here today, so I'm so grateful you're here. And I just really believe that we need to support each other and Opus does such a great job of that. It's how I met Sandeep and who I get to speak with today. So community always helps. Um, so if you're feeling like a lonely artist, go find another artist and at least go for some lady date coffees and talk about your art because it really does help. Yeah, and that is me and Sandeep. This is a perfect lead in. This is how we met, so I'm gonna Yes. lead you in i'm gonna pull up i'm in charge of sandeep's presentation because i'm so analog <laughs> so because we're working together. together yes and you're just gonna let me know when you want some slides moved there you go yeah, girl absolutely thank you so much jamie um thanks everyone for being here with us um, I love listening to Jamie talk and hearing about her creative practice. So I actually started my art career at the age of 41. And I like to share this because we are such a youth obsessed culture. And we're always talking about like hot 20 under 20 lists and 30 under 30 lists. But I want to hear about the 40 over 40 lists and the 50 over 50 lists. I want to see what people are doing later in life because there's still so much life, you know, in us. And I think we often feel like, oh, once I hit 40, I guess that's it. And so I had my son at almost 40 years old and the act of having him made me reassess my life. And I had to reprioritize and think, what do I wanna spend the next 40 or 50 years doing? And what kind of legacy do I wanna leave behind for my son? And so this picture on the left is just me, new mom, just wondering what I'm doing with my life. And then fast forward seven years later, this is my life. I am fully living a creative life. I am a professional artist, a muralist. And I wanted to also acknowledge that community is so important in living a creative life. And if I hadn't had my son, I wouldn't have had the momentum to change my life. And if I didn't have my husband, Chris, I wouldn't have had the confidence and the support to think that I could do this. And then of course, meeting Jamie, um, I think I met her and I think I met you in 2015 with Chrissy and, you know, Jamie was just kind of starting Thrive Art Studio at that time. And she was like, Sandy, come join. And so meeting Jamie was really life-changing for me. And I really, I like to uh, celebrate the people who support me and Jamie's been such a big part of my art journey and my business and my art practice. I don't think I would have the career that I have if I hadn't met Jamie. And then through Jamie, I met Penny Lane Shen of Dazed and Confucius Art Consulting. And so I've been working with her for the past six, seven years, and she's just helped me make my work better and stronger. And so, you know, I just really want to emphasize that you don't have to do it alone. And it's so much easier and so much better. And you can go so much further when you align yourself with other people who have a like-minded viewpoint. Um, okay, next. So I just want to go through like some of the things that I do. And I also just want to give you a bit of a content warning because some of my work does deal with heavy topics. So, you know, please take care. Um, these are some examples of exhibitions that I've done. And for me, I, it's really important to have a fine arts practice because that's where I get to experiment. And that's when I feel like I can really push and really evolve my practice. And so my first solo show was at the GAM Gallery, Rest in Power, and it was dedicated to 12 women who'd been murdered, um, six from my South Asian culture and six from cultures around the world. And I really just wanted to you know, talk about this really prevalent thing that happens around the world. Um, I wanted to talk about men's violence against women. I wanted to highlight these women's stories and, you know, take myself out of the stories and really center them and have people know them and know their names and preserve their memories and to hopefully have some kind of engagement or conversation offline about what's going on and, you know, how we can change it. Um, you know, because art has the capacity to really 
change the world. Like I really truly feel that art can change the world. And I think that's why I'm so invested in my art practice because I feel like I am making an impact. Um, another solo show I had was at Broad Arts Foundation and I wanted to turn the lens inward because I often tell stories of other women and I wanted to tell my own story and you know have that bravery in telling my own story and that vulnerability. And so I decided to do a show about the dark side of motherhood. So this was a residency I did at Broad Arts Foundation for 10 weeks. And I, my son had just started kindergarten. So I felt I had the time and the space to really be objective about my experience and to really delve into those feelings. Um, and so I created, I, again, like I wanted to push and evolve my practice. So I started working with textiles for the first time and essentially created these larger than life figures that are like my line drawings, but built through fabric and trim. And so these three beasts are me, the beast mother, and they're expressing three emotions that I felt really deeply at the beginning of my motherhood journey. And that was rage, uh, loneliness and sadness and emotional immaturity. Um, I wanted to talk about the complexities of motherhood. Um, we have these ideas that, you know, uh, maternal perfection is the end all be all but you know we can't be perfect as mothers we're going to make mistakes and you know there's so much anxiety and fear around that and sometimes we can feel so siloed in our loneliness um, that i really wanted to talk about it and you know give people a, a space and a platform to just kind of talk about their own feelings around motherhood or their own feelings around childhood. Um, and then uh, my recent solo show was at Surrey Art Gallery. And uh, again, I centered it around my own story. So this one was called What If? And I loosely recreated my teenage bedroom um, to, and like filled with images in uh, textile form, printed matter and object of 13 South Asian women who I think have done remarkable things. And the what if part comes in because when I was growing up, I never heard of South Asian women's accomplishments. Like we never talked about women's accomplishments in our home, uh, in my South Asian community, and really even the community in general, I didn't really hear stories of women, like remarkable stories of women. And so I recreated my bedroom to embed those women in that story and just kind of wonder like what my life would have been like had I had access to these women, how different would I have been? Okay, um, next. Wow, beautiful, powerful, Sandy. Thank you. Um, and then I also do public projects. So um, it's really important for me to have work in public space because I think access is very important and everyone should have access to art. And the way the art can activate and elevate these spaces is, is pretty incredible. Um, so another project I really was so proud to do was for Jyoti. And it was for Facade Fest with Broad Arts Foundation. So I worked with an animator, uh, Bambi Edlin, to create a five minute animation about the story of Jyoti Singh. She was the woman who was brutally assaulted in Delhi in 2012 and died of her injuries. And so, you know, it sparked national and international outrage and a lot of anger in the South Asian diaspora. And I certainly felt it. And I wanted to tell her story, but I didn't want to tell it through a lens of anger. And I think it's really important when you're telling other people's stories that you remove yourselves from the story, but you also remove your emotion from the story because you want it to center on the people that you're speaking about. And so I had to wait until that anger had dissipated for me to tell her story. And, you know, this was the perfect platform, you know, this really public space, this really grand scale. And uh, I just felt really proud of the piece because I wanted to show hope. And by the end of the animation, you know, it left you with this feeling of hope that things can change. And the woman uh, below, that's her mother, um, Asha, and she fought for her daughter. She fought for 10 years to get justice and she got it. And I'm just so proud of her. And, you know, as a mother, like you will do anything for your child. And I'm just so proud of her for persevering in a system that wasn't set up for her. Um, so yeah, so these are the types of projects that are just so important to me. And I'm so grateful that uh, I'm able to do them. Okay, next. I also have a uh, pretty prolific mural practice. So I've probably done around 30 murals. Um, I love painting on public walls. I love transforming space. Um, I love, again, the access 
that people have to these artworks. And again, you know, it can be purely decorative. Um, it can be, you know, something that has a message. Um, the mural in the bottom with the black and white woman on the on the uh, black background, that mural I painted during 2018 during the Me Too movement, and it wasn't necessarily about the Me Too movement, but that was in the news so much that it kind of like made its way into my consciousness. And I thought the mural was gonna be about, you know, speaking up and speaking out like women were doing, but it was also about taking up space, you know, because as women were often taught to not take up space and to not have a voice. And I wanted to have this larger than life figure of a woman in this public space to remind women that we can we can take up space and we can speak up, you know, it's, it's our right. Um, you know, and the mural on the top left, I did for the Vancouver Art Gallery for um, their Spotlight Art Rental and Sales Program. And this one was dedicated to Sarah Everard and Sabina Nessa, who were murdered about four months apart in the UK. And again, those ideas around women's safety and, you know, how, why is it so hard for women to be able to like walk to her friend's house without being assaulted or walk to the pub to meet her friend? You know, what kind of world are we living in when it's not safe for 50% of the population? Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to talk about my feelings around hope and anger that oscillate, you know, when I hear these stories and then the tiger is that reminder to take action because, you know, if you're just mired in the feelings, nothing can happen, but, you know, you have to take action to have any kind of impact. And then um, I have an illustration and design practice as well. So I work with commercial clients like Holt Renfrew, which is the top left um, for a holiday winter campaign. Um, I, look, I work with local organizations like uh, the Whitecaps. I did their Vasaki logo last year. Um, they're using it again for the match this Saturday. I did the Canucks, the Valley jersey um, last fall. Um, so I really appreciate these opportunities to partner with local organizations as well. And then last but not least, uh, this is one of my absolute favorite projects ever, Stories for South Asian Supergirls. Um, I was invited, I was one of 10 South Asian female illustrators invited to do portraits of, you know, 50 remarkable South Asian women. And so this book houses 50 biographies with illustrations by South Asian artists. I did six portraits, uh, some of the women I hadn't heard of. Um, and so now I know their stories and I'm just, so inspired by them. And this was the book I wish I'd had as a kid. I didn't have access to this as a kid. Um, you know, I wanted that representation. And so I'm just so thrilled to be a part of this so I can give this to the younger generation and they'll have that access that I never had growing up. And, you know, hopefully that'll shape their identity in a way that mine wasn't shaped. And yeah, that's it. I basically just, I love art. I love that I have the capacity to make it and to talk about things that are really important. Thank you so much, Sandeep and Jamie. Sandeep, that's uh, been a busy seven years, huh? Hmm? Just a oh. little bit? Are you tired? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. I'm very tired. tired. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, so I, I have a question here for you. Um, I guess there's one for Sandeep about uh, you make you you have these images that look like quilts. Are they indeed are they quilts or are they painted? Painted. Painted. Yeah, yeah. I would love to make a quilt. Uh, my sewing skills are not that great, but yeah, that's definitely on the docket. Okay. Fabric was the beast mother. Yeah. Project that you. Yeah. That was the first time you used fabric in the practice, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so I'm gonna ask you a question. Is the first is the first question that came to my mind after listening to both of your podcasts, and the question is, do you have a meditation practice, and any advice for getting into um, <laughs> and sustaining the flow state while making art? Hmm. Yeah, Jamie, <laughs> I wish I wish we were different than who we are. I mean, my flow state is just keep working at it, and just honestly, my motto has always been do the work. And I, I mean, I do exercise. That to me is actually the thing that kind of like gets me, you know, motivated. But 
Um, no, I wish I cleared the mind in a more intentional way, Sandy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be honest, I have no boundaries when it comes to art. So art is my meditation, you know, and yeah. when I'm when I'm creating art, that is what calms me. It's what clears my mind. But it's also dangerous because I have no boundaries between my work and my home life and, you know, my hobbies, like they're all kind of centered around art. Um, I also am kind of well, a little bit macabre. So I listen to a lot of true crime and it's very strange, but I find it kind of meditative. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just because I do so much work around that, that I am fascinated by these stories. Um, so, yeah. I, it's, yeah <laughs> it's, it's my kind of version of that is I listen to magic things like Harry Potter like I go opposite I can't go into real life I go opposite and I draw and listen to magic so I should we're probably two different ends of the spectrum <laughs> very very strange nice um okay so we've got a question in the chat uh so so as humans, we, we all want our voices to be heard. And as artists, we want our voices to be heard through visual expert, like expression. So if, if somebody's wanting to make art and maybe they feel they don't have strong technical skills, how do they get around that? Any advice? I mean, I always, um, so two things I would say that has helped me a lot is actually uh, diving into making personal symbols. So, and that can be, you know, any material, like that can be collage, that can be, um, but if you're looking for voice, I think a really easy gateway is like identifying the things you wanna say and then starting to craft symbols that for you can represent, Penny Lane calls it your visual vocabulary. So it's a vocabulary that is true to you and that for me, actually, that Mother Time show I, I showed you in the presentation, that show forced me to get very clear on my visual vocabulary and a lot of symbols that now are everywhere in my work. And I think of them as like, I mean, I use the egg symbol a lot. I think of them as Easter eggs and this idea that if you know my work, I love the idea that someone could be like, oh, there's, you know, the time piece that represents like loss and time passing for this artist and so you don't have to be able to draw you don't have to be able to paint but if you have something you want to say start thinking about how you can visually craft these into symbols can be really hard can really help your work and also the more you write about your work I think the stronger voice you can have when you start to make it yeah that I I echo what Jamie says um when I like I had done two university degrees before I went to art school when I was 30 and then I didn't really do much art so when I was getting back into the swing of things I had to ask myself two questions what's my why why am I making the work that I'm making and why should anyone care about it and the second one was around finding my voice and so you know whenever I had a moment I would go into the spare room and I would just draw like with no plan just draw for the sake of drawing and then I did it for about a year and I started noticing um, certain motifs and patterns and symbols would emerge. And so that's that was the kind of beginning of my visual language. And, you know, I look at a lot of art. I look at a lot of folk art. Um, I'm really inspired by folk art. So I'll often take like older images of folk art and I'll redraw them in a more contemporary way. So that's a way that you can just kind of practice. Um, but I think it's really important to know why you're making the work that you're making and, you know, what is your visual language, because mm -hmm. it is important to have a cohesive voice because people recognize it. And then, you know, like, especially with my murals, people now will be like, oh, isn't that your mural over there and over there? Because they can see that cohesiveness in the visual language. And I think to like what you're saying, Sandeep, is that you really have to make a lot of art and yes. it can be crappy art, it doesn't matter. It has to build on each other to have enough there to pull the visual language you want. I, in my early days, didn't make enough art. So I never could get to the meat of what I was doing because it stopped every time. And so 
it wasn't. And I think that's why applying for shows before you feel ready or, you know, saying you're going to do a series, whether you show it to anyone can be really helpful because it forces you to create enough to actually pull the meat out and say, this is what I talk about. This is why I make the work. And then once you start doing that, you don't want to stop anyways. Yeah. The times you want to stop is when you feel like you haven't got that momentum going. And it's, you know, those are the hard times when you're in it. It's actually easy. It's more oh. painful thinking about doing it than doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Much and that's more painful. Yeah, you just have to do it. And like, you have to make a lot of bad work to get to the good stuff. And sometimes I'll spend like two days doing something and it's complete garbage. And then from that two days, I'm like, oh, this thing. And I can pull that one thing out of it and turn it into something magical. And so it really just comes down to doing the work. Like Jamie always says, you know, just rolling up your sleeves and just creating for the sake of creating. Um, yeah. It, and and things will emerge and also i think it's it's important to be honest with yourself i'm not like i'm not a good painter but i i can draw and i love drawing and so i love a flat graphic that is my style and you know i'm like oh maybe i should do things that are more gradient or more you know but or, or looser but i'm like that's not me you know mm -hmm. so i try to stay as true as possible to who i am and i like tight compositions i like tight graphics and you know it's what I'm good at and so mm -hmm. how I kind of get around you know remaining stagnant is then taking that style and using it in different mediums like mural painting like textile like installation like animation I think it's easy too to get distracted like when you're not in your own work especially with Instagram and I, I know for me if I'm like not making enough it's so easy, it caught up in like, I love this piece, maybe my work should be more this. And you start to like distract yourself, you start to pull away from what is good. And so that statement, Cindy, when you're like, I know I'm good at this, so I'm gonna do it. I think there's power in that, you know, yeah. figure out what you're good at and stick with it. Penny Lane talks a lot about that. She says the artists that are really like tight artists always want to be loose painters. Yeah. <laughs> and then the loose painters always want to be like tight graphic. And so you can't yeah. win anyway. So you might as well just make what you're good yeah. at. Totally. Yeah. That's great advice. Thank you both. Um, so another question for you. What role does the artist have in society? Sandy, but I feel like this is your jam. So oh. I um, want to get rolling. <laughs> one that is underpaid and undervalued. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I really, I, I, as part of my art practice, I really um, do a lot of advocacy and education. You know, I want people to know that you're okay playing, paying your plumber or your lawyer, but for some reason you want to haggle with the artist. And, you know, these last seven years, I've really had to learn how to um know my worth and my value and you know it's been a lot of conversations with jamie you know and talking about that business side of art um so i feel like first of all people need to recognize the importance of the artist in society and i think as artists we have the ability to express things in ways that people can digest them so when i make my work around these really heavy topics i always make sure that it's aesthetically beautiful because i want the viewer to be able to you know, look at the work and be drawn into the work and, you know, make some sense of it. But as they're, you know, looking a little bit longer, they might see something that's a bit off or a bit sinister or something lurking under the surface that causes them to question. And so my work is about questioning, you know, questioning the world we live in, questioning ourselves and the roles we play. Um, so I think like we just, we're in a very unique position and, you know, I don't take that for granted. And so like, I really want to use my art for good. Mm -hmm. I also think that, you know, in my 20s, when I was very lost, I, one thing I did do was travel quite a bit. And I always went to, you know, a historical art museum. And I always went to sort of the contemporary art museum in a city I was in if I could. Mm -hmm. And I think artists really document the world around us because mm -hmm. we've learned and it, I think it's becoming more and more apparent that the history books are written for with a a lens and they're written by specific people. And I think as a kid, I didn't 
you know, understand that. But now as an adult, whereas the artist, it's truth. It's a truth. It's a take on the world around them. And I think the more we create a society that all we care about is production and, you know, I can go on and on about this with motherhood and all these things as well as like, we're losing out on the ability to like see this truth that I think only artists can really bring, um, you know, and authors as well, but it's, it's just a different sense of where we are now, what is happening. And I, I just believe in it. I think it's important. Yeah. And you're right. It does provide that snapshot in time and that sort of social political document, you know, like of what is happening. Like when I went to Buenos Aires for my honeymoon back in the day, um, we went on a mural tour and that was my first time like on a mural tour and looking at all of these uh, murals all over the city. And a lot of them were about social issues and political topics. And it really stuck with me. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, you can do that. You can put this on the wall and you can talk about these things that are painful or people are struggling with. And you can communicate that through pictures, you know, mm -hmm. through color, through pattern. It's And it's people remarkable. want to see it. It's so different. Or people, by making it beautiful or intentionally unbeautiful, you know, yeah. it is, the visual language is very powerful. I mean, yeah. it's been used and abused throughout time, right? It's very powerful. Yeah. So we have power and I think we're kind of in a place in a society where we don't sometimes remember that because mm -hmm. we are undervalued, underpaid. And there's a lot of us. And I think we start to realize when we go on social media, it can feel oversaturated. You can have those moments of why bother? It's mm -hmm. already all been said, but it is important. And your particular voice and lens is important. Yeah. And no one will have your voice, right? Yeah. There's enough room for everyone and you are uniquely you and you have your own unique voice. And so no one can take that away from you. Thank you both so much for that. Um, okay, so question, this is the practical question. It's about um, how to get your art out into the world. How, any advice for people wanting to show, show their work? Jamie, you gotta make a lot of work. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is kind of my jam. This is what we talk a lot about, but yeah, it it is, you know, first it starts with you. And I think, you know, Sandeep, you said it so well as you ask yourself these questions, why are you making it and why should anyone care? And mm -hmm. then the next kind of set of questions is who, who do you want to care? Where do you want this work being seen? You know, taking that power back, it's not just about get the, like getting the work out in the world isn't about just, it can go anywhere. It's having a clear vision of who you are. And, and that can take time. Like I laugh at when I, I quit my teaching job at 26, 27. And I found actually quite recently a journal where I had my goals and all the things I was going to do. The timeline was bananas. It was like within this year, Five years from now, you know, we set these timelines. We think it should look a certain way, but it actually is the long game. That is one of the biggest lessons I've learned. And it's your life. It, it, it's who we are. And that's a different thing. It's a unique business. It's a unique path in life that no other will take you, I think, in the same way that you bleed into your work and, and in, the, in the best way and in the hardest way. And mm -hmm. so by having that time frame, by extending your timeline in your head, you have more power because you can start to think, what is this vision of this art, to, art career? What type of work, like when we see Sandeep's career, like, you know, Sandeep early on, I always ask people to find their greats. And Sandeep said, I want a career like this. I want a career like this. You were always very clear. And that changed and morphed. And half the time I was like, you crazy. I know that artist. <laughs> They're tired all the time. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, but you know, you by look, you know, we want to look around. We want to visit our art, art spaces. What are they about? Who's actually going there? What do they care about? Are is your work a fit? I think by reshaping the lens of how we think of getting our art out there, whether that means you take on a part-time job or a full-time job to give yourself more time. Yeah. I really believe good art isn't made under, you know, crushing financial times. I think 
finan- I think financial hardship can produce great art. I think it really can. It can create that fire under your butt to get out there. Um, but you want to be careful with that. I, I literally blew up my life, quit everything and said I was going to be art, an artist within the next three I years. Too, and it didn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. It, it, it's a, but it does in some ways because you yeah. become a hustler. You, yeah. be, you have to make that work. You know, I, I believe for some people blowing it all up works in some yeah. ways. And a lot of ways it doesn't. <laughs> sure. And it's not like I don't advocate hustle culture, but I am a hustler and like I work, you know, like yeah. I work a lot. I work all the time. Being an artist is not for the faint of heart. And so I think we have these like uh, ideas of like, oh, I'll be the lone artist in my giant studio just making work all day. But it's like admin, it's marketing, it's accounting, like it's networking. Like there's so much behind the scenes that cuts into your actual creative time. And so learning how to manage both. And the business part is what I learned from Jamie because I never really <laughs> realized like, oh, it's a business. Um, you know, and Jamie's just so savvy and just had so many great tips and tricks. And so I think it's like, figure out why you're doing what you're doing start developing that voice, start creating like a cohesive body of work, maybe like eight to 10 pieces that kind of, you know, go together. And then, um, you know, post on Instagram. I got my first solo show from Instagram, just from like posting images. And then they reached out to me like, Sandy, do you want to show at our gallery? And I was like, ah. Um, So Instagram can be a really powerful tool. Um, There's always calls for proposals on art websites, like um, I think Akimbo, uh, I can't, I can't think of any others that come to mind, but there's like lots of those sites that have like art proposals. So you can apply to things. Um, there's no shame in like getting your work up in a coffee shop, in a tattoo parlor, in a restaurant, you know, having your work just out there. It's better to be out there in some form than sitting under your bed. You know what I mean? Also to um, that point is like a big thing is that you're not going to be discovered like that illusionary yeah. myth that they pretended happened. I don't know if that's like old time where galleries yeah. ruled the roost here, but unless you, it's like participating. Yes. And, you know, the only reason, Sandy, you got that show off Instagram was because you had the voice, the body, all these steps were done and you were prepared. Because the big thing is if you're at, if you're given an opportunity, you need to be able to say yes powerfully and show up and we so sometimes we think all we want is this opportunity but if we reframe to actually you're getting set up for when that opportunity comes so that you can say yes so that you can put your best work out there and lead to more it can help us kind of get out of the scarcity mindset of like how are my work ever going to be shown you know yeah. And even like, I hate the word networking. Um, I don't think about it in that typical smarmy way, but like, it's really important to wherever you live to go to shows, to go to openings, to connect with people within your community. I get a lot of my opportunities from my relationships that I've built with people, you know, and I don't go out to events going, oh, there's that curator. I should talk to them. I just let things evolve organically. I build relationships with people. And then, you know, I'll do a project. They'll recommend me for a project with someone else. And then maybe they'll bring me back for another project. So I hate this expression, but it's so true. Your uh, network is your net worth. Like it really Mm -hmm. is, you know, like who you know matters. We talk about it at DVN as your Thrive ecosystem. And there's sort of layers to this ecosystem, but it can kind of help instead of thinking of it networking, you're actually building building and you're building sort of your system that you sit in and it takes work. Again, none of these things just happen. Um, it takes relationship building and showing up. And one thing I wanted to add to this conversation is that there is zero shame in just making art and getting it into the world. Yeah. It does change the game when you want to make your living. Like what we're talking about is if you want to make a living from your art, then you bring in the business, then you need your ecosystem set up. Like, and that's where the hustle happens. And that's just entrepreneurship. That's yeah. just making it go at what, whether you're going to sell toothbrushes or art, you got to hustle mm-hmm. when you decide that that's how you're going to pay your bills. But the act of making art has nothing to do with that. 
So I think sometimes we get caught up in that it needs to look a certain way. We need to be supporting ourselves and absolutely not. Like there are amazing artists that have full-time careers and other things they love that help them financially feel good and safe so that they can make amazing art in mm. these quiet moments. So never feel that you have to, you know, add money into your practice to make it valid or worthy. Yeah. And it, it is a lot. Cause like I, like when I, my husband was the breadwinner when I left my job and then as I was building up my practice, he ended up staying at home with our son so I could build up my practice. And then he changed careers, careers. And so now I'm the breadwinner. And so I am actually making a living from my art, but it is stressful because if I don't take on a million projects, I'm making less money. And, you know, in 2021, I did very well, but last year I was so burnt out. I had to step back a bit and I had to say no to things. And I saw my income drop, you know? So it is, it's like the more you work, the more you make, but at what cost, right? And so I'm, I'm just stepping back a little bit just to, you know, make sure I don't get completely yeah. burnt out. And it can ebb and flow and like totally. having a season where you step back and maybe you're having your a baby or you are, you need to work for the family. Like all of those things are valid because again, we extend our timeline. Art is a long game. This is just a blip. This is just yep. a short time in this story that you know, you're never going to include in your retrospective when you're at the Vancouver Art Gallery at 80, so. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. So, so a question for the artists who have, say they've, they've done the work, they have the art made, and they're, they're getting it out into the world, and they were, they're just been intuitively doing this and working on their art, and all of a sudden they realize that this could be a business. How does that artist start to bring business into their life and thinking about it and organizing it? Any advice? Jamie's got a lot of advice for that. Just <laughs> brimming to share. <laughs> um, go really slow and don't just quit your job and say now you're a full-time pay being yeah. paid artist. It's yeah. a it's a layered approach. So start by putting things on Instagram with a price below it. See what happens. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about having the shop, the thing, the this. Like, I think a big thing is we create a lot of uh, barriers. We create a lot of steps before we can, we say, okay, now it's this because it has to look perfect. All mm -hmm. it is, is, you know, start a little tiny newsletter with your close family and friends and put two pieces that are for sale. Um, you know, say that you're going to do it plan a show and and you can apply and get one but you can also like I've done for many years rented a space and put on my own show and put up price tags um but it's getting at, at the idea that it's going to look and feel a certain way it's not it's going to be slow it's going to be uncomfortable it's going to feel weird and but that's how you start and you start by being brave and saying I want to accept payment I want I want to accept the that other people want this and I'm not just going to keep giving it away and and it's it's really a choice that you decide to make and then it's all about unfortunately and I hate you're going to hate this it's just about getting organized you mm -hmm. know because then you bring in do you want to sell online do you want how are you going to do this how are you going to keep track of your bookkeeping how are you going to start you're going to bring in these business side of things and yeah, yeah. And this it's is going to feel I, weird. This is why I do multiple things because, um, you know, in 2021, I painted eight murals and it was insane and it was very good income. Um, but this year I'm not painting any murals. I'm painting maybe like two murals. And, and so I have to shift and recalibrate and be like, okay, well, that money that I normally make from this, how am I going to make up for it over here? And so that's why my um, practice is so diverse because, you know, I, I feel like I know many artists who just make physical goods to sell. And to me, I find that so stressful, but like they're all finding their own ways to make it work. And so that's why I find I like doing things that are more project-based. So I do things on a 
base like project basis so that you know i'm you know doing a drawing for this i'm doing illustration for that i'm doing a mural with this gallery i you know um so that i don't feel that stress of like me having to just produce like a, a whole schwack load of work and then figure out a way to sell it that and that's also for my personality to like what what sandeep means too when she's saying she doesn't use projects she's working with clients so they're literally giving her a brief and say, we want art like this. And I'm sure you have dream clients that say, make whatever you want, we're gonna oh, yeah. love it, and they do. Totally. But there's also a whole bunch of not dream clients that micromanage everything that's happening. And some artists would hate that. They want to just make the work they have and then they'll figure out how to sell it. So yeah. starting to understand who you are as an artist, who you are as an entrepreneur and as a person, again, this is time <laughs> and uh, is gonna help you Decide and let go of some things. Some things we think we want, um, we don't actually want to, we are actually people that want to live it that way. Yeah. You know, um, it just looks really good. And there's great pictures on Instagram. Tells us yeah. that we should want that. Yeah. And if anyone has, you know, young children or, you know, are wondering how do you do it with a child? Um, I just didn't give my child a choice. So, you know, I had no family in Vancouver. So my only choice, like I wasn't gonna pay a million dollars a month for childcare. So he just, I just threw him in the stroller and he just came with me. And so I just embedded him into my art practice and into my art life. And so I am lucky because he is a very extroverted kid and he likes doing different things. So that plays in our favor, but, you know, just make, them a part of your life like just make them come with you embed them in that space because you know it, art should be a space for children too and oftentimes the art world can feel very unfriendly to children and so I've had to just bring him with me and just be like I don't care like he's here mm -hmm. um so you know you just whatever you can whatever way you can find to make it work just do it mm -hmm. amazing thank you so much uh so on the top of business, there are a couple questions in the chat here about how you price your work. Is there an equation that you use? Uh, an easy answer is if you're a painter or if you're doing 2D work, you do it by square inch and you can, there's tons of YouTube videos online and you can email me and I can send you one. Um, but basically it's just a formula. You can do it by square inch and kind of find a price point that way. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of it's, you wanna look at what past has sold. You wanna look at artists that are in a similar stage in their practice as you to help you kind of find a price. The biggest thing you do, you don't wanna do at the beginning is outprice yourself um, because it's, you can't go back. So it's actually better, you know, start, if you're unsure high or low, start a little low, but then I always tell artists like every year you should increase those prices. If you're new, that might be every kind of like three months as things start to sell and that's okay. Prices can go up. You don't want to go down because you've already sold at a higher price. And then, you know, Cindy, we've had tons of conversations around client work, Mm -hmm. how to price it at the beginning you want to be upfront and say what is your budget and hopefully you know that can help you kind of guide you you want to meet other artists and just you know feel when you're in a when you feel confident you can have these types of conversations you want to start asking asking artists how do you charge how, what does this look like and uh I think those would be my quick ones yeah um yeah like jamie said like if you're a painter and there's painters who do like a similar style like say abstract works or something go to their websites and see how much they charge and then see like how experienced they are so if they're more experienced than you of course you have to charge less right um but it just gives you an idea of like the range um i still have trouble with pricing i i really hate it but i base it off previous projects then i just intuitively i'm like oh that number feels good and if it's a little bit and, when it, and to the point of feels good we you're gonna and you get that feeling when you've done work and typically when you've done it you've been screwed <laughs> you screwed yourself because you didn't give yourself enough credit totally. or you over try charge and so then you lost a client like you start to, and then you know how much time things take because at the beginning you think oh I could draw that in like two hours 
But then you forget if you're working with a client, you're going to have revisions. You yeah. forget that you're going to have emails back and forth. So you start to understand the process of actually getting this work out in the world and mm -hmm. your price can become a lot clearer um, with that. Be very, you know, and also when you're looking at artists that are similar to you, look for artists that are actually selling work. You know, yeah. be careful not to find an artist where you're like, oh, this seems great. This is $5,000. You want to look at Instagram and see like, they're like shipping out work today. Yeah. Okay, this one's sold because that price point just might be throwing you off. So the mm. more artist community you can have, the larger you're investing in other artists, it's going to be easier for you because you can ask these types of questions. Yeah. And if you're in Canada, you can look at Carfac. Carfac yeah. is a great uh, minimum fee schedule that is supportive for artists. Um, also, it, it's really, my money is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable talking about money, you know, and sometimes I'll have artists reach out to me and be like, Sandeep, this client wants this. I don't know how much to charge. And then I'll either tell them, well, I charged this much, but, you know, this is your first project. So you're going to charge in this range. Or I might just say, like, um, I would probably charge in this range, uh, maybe talk to so and so who's at a similar place, you know, so I'm OK giving advice to people. And even asking for budgets like that was so uncomfortable for me at the beginning being like what's your budget and now i'm just like what's your budget scope and timeline and like that's yeah. it and yeah. and you, you know. and it is like this muscle you have to build and the more i think too because you realize that if you undercharge or you don't think about these things then you end up <laughs> actually making life way more difficult for your future self because mm -hmm. what happens is if you do a project that's, you know, for 200 bucks, that should have been $1,200, that person's going to tell another person, oh, hire Sandeep, it was only $200. Yeah. So then that next person comes to you and they're even harder because they're like, well, you did it already for this price. So, you know, we don't want to get so scared about this that we don't put our, you know, set things in motion and take action, but you want to be thoughtful because the more you undersell yourself, you're actually underselling like artists as a whole, if we want to get, you know, big here, but you're kind of screwing over everyone if you're underselling yourself and your work. Totally. We need some sort of standardization so we people can, mm -hmm. you know, look. And also like at this point in my career, people aren't just paying me for the thing, they're paying me for my name recognition they're paying me for a level of expertise and education they're paying for a level of professionalism you know so all of that factors into it the more well known you are the more you can charge mm -hmm. thank you both so much for that i'm actually i'm right now i just looked at the clock and we we are at 12 o'clock i think this oh, is wow. the quickest event that's ever happened <laughs> with Opal virtually, it just seems to have like flown by with the two of you today. Yeah, so we could talk forever. <laughs> I know, we need to, you need to cut us off. We could listen to you, I'm sure forever too. <laughs> Although just, just out of respect and uh, both of your time today, I just like to ask maybe just in closing, if you have any final words of advice, just for people in the audience who, who are artists, they're living the creative life and just, uh, tips for staying creative and um, uh, just for making art. I would say just be true to who you are, like know who you are. If you don't want to paint a mural, don't paint a mural. You know what I mean? If you don't want to do abstract work, don't do abstract work. Stay true to who you are and what you're interested in. Um, really figure out what you want to say and really develop that visual vocab. But the most important thing is the community building, like really get out there and like meet people, go to shows, go to events, talk to people um, because you can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. I think it's really fitting, you know, that Opus is talking about a creative life because I think the act of being an artist is a lifestyle choice. It is an act of saying you're doing something different. Um, and I think the more artists you find and bring into your circle, the more you feel at home, the more you feel that you're not that different. I call the outer world, you know, the muggles. And if you try to tell the muggles that, you know, you're going to be an artist, like they're just the look that it's, it's the whole thing. 
So it's just important that you find your people um, and that because it is a life and it's not going, you're never going to achieve the thing that got you the thing and it's over. It's just not that type of career. It's not that type of work. You're going to get to that thing and think, I could have done this better. The next thing's going to be this. You you will be your own worst enemy. So yeah. enjoy the process, find your people and your work is important. Yeah. And just remember you're, you're in charge. So your art career can look any way you want, right? Yeah. So you get to decide how your career looks.